Welcome to Living Well with Dr. John, Adjustment Through the Lifespan. Before we begin, I'm going to share two webinar disclaimers. The first is, this is for educational purposes only. For psychological services, please contact your state psychological association for referral. The second disclaimer is, the questions, comments, and opinions expressed during this webinar may not express the views and beliefs of the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation. Now for some background on Dr. John. Dr. John Chang is a clinical psychologist and is board certified in rehabilitation psychology. He is a professor of psychology at East Stroudsburg University, as well as consulting psychologist. Dr. Chang also has a private practice through Doctors On Demand. Two quick notes before we begin. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be available on the Reeve Foundation YouTube channel. And if you would like to ask Dr. John a question, please use the Q&A box located on the bottom of your screen. Now I'm going to turn it over to John. Hi, John. Thank you, Kaylee. Thank you, Foundation, for your continuous support of our podcast. This is uh, Dr. John. Talk to me. So I want to thank the Foundation once again for supporting this podcast. I'd like to thank Angela uh, for guiding us through this process. And Kaylee, uh, she's, she keeps me going and making sure I'm doing the right thing. So, so as, as I indicated in the title, it says, talk to me. So if you have a question, please put it out. I want to be as intimate as possible, as detailed as possible. I think that's what makes this podcast um, enjoyable and interesting, um, getting the details of the questions because I can talk in generality, um, but you, as you and I know, that'll go in and out of our years most of the time. So, but what I'm gonna do is, I haven't seen you guys in about five weeks. So I, it, it's almost weird that we do this once a month, but just having that extra week makes me feel a little rusty. So, but I, I want to go over some of the, the questions and comments before we start. So it, it allows you to set up a little bit of where we're going and what I'm hoping to answer today. So, so when we ask the, in the people who are on today, the, what is the most difficult issue you had in adjusting to your spinal cord injury? Many people wrote, well, the walking, um, bowel evacuation, bladder, bowel and bladder, uh, depending on others, feeling like a burden. Some people wrote down um, complete change in lifestyle, loss of function, attitudes of medical professionals, Society's perception of me, less than. Lack of ability to do things I enjoy. A lot of bow and bow, pro bow programs. I'm gonna be with you on that one. Um, anger. Tied to the restroom, another bow. Pain, you know, there's always pain. Two third of us of spinal cord injury have pain issues. This one's, this one's dear to me at right now, finding caregivers. I will I'll talk a little bit about that towards the end, but finding caregivers, that's a huge issue in my life right now. So here's some questions. And, I'm, and again, I'm preempting it because I'm hoping with, with our guest speaker today, Clinton Cook, as well as uh, some of the things I'm gonna go, it may address most of these issues. Uh, fighting depression, having spinal cord injury. Are you supposed to have depression? And if you do have it, how do we get out of it? How to find purpose in life. That's a great one. That is a real good one. how to 
develop perseverance, how to be more, well, resilience, how to build resilience, actually it's written. So those are the main concerns from our viewers today. And I'm hoping by addressing some of these things uh, today, we're going to be able to answer it. So uh, we talked a little bit about, or at least in my paragraph in describing what we're going to talk about is how do you avoid depression, anxiety, and isolation? How do we do that? You know, how do, it's so easy to do. It's so easy to just want to sit back and not deal with the world. And when you do that, sometimes the depression and the anxiety starts to come. I'll start with a little bit of what's been happening around me. And so I went to Cape May a couple of weeks ago and I don't travel often. Why don't I travel often? Because it's a pain in the ass to travel. Um, those who are listening, how many of you like flying? How, yes or no? I mean, isn't flying a pain in the butt? Or how many of you like finding places to have? Now, for me, I need a rowing shower. I like to shower every day. It's almost impossible unless you go to a, a, a new hotel to find a row. So, uh, so it's easy to stay home because at home, I have everything. I have, you know, my bathrooms. I have my, uh, my lifts, all the things I need. And uh, so I, I tend not to travel too often, but I, when I do, I love it. I enjoy traveling. I enjoy being at a new place, uh, new people, new scene. And, and Cape, Bay, Cape May is a beautiful area. Uh, how many people have ever been in Cape May as, as listeners? Anybody has been at, gone to Cape May? So, uh, so going to a new location, I I was excited. Um, brought the brought my team of, of of caregivers I need or people, and I've never been in this house before. And you know, unfortunately, the room was very small. Um, we had to make a do of, of the bed that was there. Um, I was, you know, isolated to the one floor. I, I couldn't get up to the second or third floor, like other places that had elevators. So, so that, you know, I knew that was going to happen, uh, but not until you, not until you get there, you, until you realize, well, okay, this is, I'm limited to these things and I can't do the certain other things. Um, but I know I need to get out there. I know. I need to avoid depression, to avoid isolation. I need to keep pushing myself to be out there. That creates a lot of anxiety. I, I remember the few days prior to going, I was having a lot of uh, nightmares. And I was like, oh my God, this, these nightmares. I know it stems from going to having to travel soon. So, uh, so if you have increased nightmares, it, it, uh, you know, you have a lot more anxiety um, about, did you know that around two thirds of people have dreams of being chased or being, uh, so that's a very common anxiety nightmare for those of, uh, those of you. So, so again, traveling, I needed to travel. I need, I want to travel because I want to continue to integrate in life. Um, some of the other things that I, I started doing uh, over time, and, and I'm going to talk a little bit more in depth is uh, listening to audible, audible books. And I also told in the last podcast that I was going to talk about gaming. I tried, now I'm an old man. I'm, an, I'm back in the old days when you have a quarter and you're sticking a and the machine and you have one joystick and two buttons. And so I started, I tried to play video games. Oh, wow, that, that is a, that is a whole nother world. I'll tell you a, a whole nother world. And 
And uh, but it's but it is interesting if once I mean it took it took me four weeks to figure out even how to play these things. So um, we're, uh, we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Well, you know what? I'm going to talk about it now since it's it's in my mind right now. So think of it. Xbox, PlayStation, all these other games. I don't know. I I needed something. And again, what does this have to do with psychology? I needed something to distract my life. One of the best coping skills or one of the best things to have to cope with this paralysis is to have something in your life that you readily can get without having to ask people and be a burden that will distract your life from thinking about your injury. That is a coping skill. That is something I always tell my patients, find something to do. So get, so get this, picture this. I get a client, they're in therapy and we start to talk and they start with, a lot of fidgety, they're in pain, they're, they're, they're breathing heavy, they just seem overwhelmed. But you can see the difference if you have a videotape of the person. You're talking about something interesting, you're talking about a lot of time about their life. So they're focused about something. And when you get them focused about something and they're not thinking about everything else, all of a sudden they're distracted and their body calms down and their breathing calms down and their pain goes away. They're not talking about the pain all the time. And they're in the zone at that moment. It's, it's, it's a lot like meditation. It's not like yoga because you're focusing on one thing. It's a distraction. And that's how one of the ways we deal with our paralysis is to find something that can take us away to another world. Gaming does that. Gaming can do that. So, so you should be amazed when I had to, well, had to figure out how to, I mean, Xbox, you got 28 buttons or 28,000 buttons. Um, and it's, it's amazing how many buttons are on these controllers, but I had to figure that out. But then I had to get a thing called quad stick, which is use, use your mouth to manipulate things. So it literally took me a month to figure this out after hours every day of learning. I had to get on YouTube. I have to give a shout out to a, a guy named Steamy Biscuit. He is an active gamer and um, I actually emailed him and he cooked he taught me for a couple of hours how to understand how to program these quad sticks. Now, they, these things qu can get quite expensive. Um, and there are grants to help you purchase that, I know. Um, the Xbox itself, I had borrowed one from a friend who I w wasn't using his. And, but man, I'll tell you, I felt like a kid again. I felt like I was 19 before my accident, playing a game. Uh, now I was racing cars, I was flying jets. Um, I hate to say, but I got to shoot people legally on these games. I was like, whoa, it's amazing. Um, I was addicted and for an hour or two, and I hate to say it, sometimes three, I was, I was lost. I was in a different world playing video games. Now, if I lose all my jobs because I can't, if I don't start doing my work because I'm playing video games too much, uh, here's, here's my confession, I guess, but I'm hoping I'm not going to do that. But um, yeah, it, 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 it was an opportunity to forget about what was going on with life. And that felt good. That felt good about where I was at. Um, same thing with going on vacation. You know, 
again, I don't go on vacation often, um, but what I noticed is that I didn't have any of my computers. I didn't have anything. And I just enjoy what was happening. And when I came home and I had all these things around me to do, my brain didn't know what to do for a day. I was like, uh oh, I have to shift gears. And, and you need that. You need that. It, your brain's like an ATM. You got to deposit things. You can't keep withdrawing because if you keep withdrawing, your brain's going to get fried and you're going to just all get overrun. So you have to deposit into your brain. You got to put money in and playing the games. It's a deposit going on vacations. It's a huge deposit. It may be a huge financial cost too, but at least psychologically, it is a deposit into your well Um, does anyone game on here? I'm going to ask on here if you want. Does anyone play games? I don't know. Am I the only 50 year old guy that is actually learning how to play video games? So that sounds a little, uh, sounds so weird, isn't it? It's just, I'm an old man trying to find a new game, but, but the games are amazing. So the graphics are incredible. So those are some of the things that I, uh, that I think is important in fighting these issues. Now, it's not going to help with your bowel and bladder issue, okay? And it doesn't help with those issues, but it does help with the pain. It does help with depression, okay? And if I get any good at playing games, I'm hoping I can get on the internet and get on some of these games and play with against others and kick some ass on and not even, and then tell them that, you know, I'm a quadriplegia kicking their asses. So, um, so look, only 14% play. So, so again, but so it's not a lot of us do that, but um, you should definitely pick it up if you think it's something that you you're interested. Not, not, not everybody is a gamer. Now we, we have a guest named Clint. And Clip's gonna come on. I, I don't know. He might. He's a type that probably may be playing, may play games. Um, so, can we get Clint on right now, Kaylee? There you go. So Clint's gonna have to turn on his microphone. There you go. In the video. Yeah, you're in. Awesome. Clint, good, good afternoon. How are you doing? I'm doing wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, thank, you for thank you for coming on and being on with us today. Now, I, I have to intro a little bit of Clint. Clint is a, I met Clint because Clint is a, one of the administrator of a big Facebook website, um, over 10,000 members. He, a friend of mine actually referred me to him and said, hey, you got to meet this guy named Clint down in Atlanta. He does everything. Uh, my, a friend of mine named Juan Shen, uh, one of your bow buddies down way back in quad rugby days, right? <laughs> and um, so Clint um, started quad rugby in Atlanta. He's a big supporter of, of people with disabilities. I know he, he's, he advocates for a lot of support groups. He started four of them. Um, he does a lot of extracurricular activities. And that's one of the reasons why I brought Clint on because I'm not, a, I don't do a lot I'm from my end. I, although I've tried skiing once and sculling and a little bit airplane gliding and quad rugby. I did play quad rugby for Philadelphia at one time, but I, Clint does a lot more. And so I guess I want to start with Clint is, can you tell me a little bit about how you be had became your spinal, how it became a spinal cord injury. Yeah, uh, um, and I appreciate you having me on, John, absolutely. Um, Juan Shin, uh, him and I, we go way, way back. <laughs> um, so my injury happened in 1988. Uh, I broke my neck in a car accident, uh, C5, uh, incomplete. Um, I do have some C7 function. Uh, on my left side, I do have uh, abdominal muscles and I have a little bit of leg function. Um, you know, 33 years post injury and 53 years old, I'm not out there running marathons at all, but you know, I can still 
uh, stained a little bit uh, to grab things out of the cabinet and that kind of stuff. But um, about a year after my injury, I decided to be a full-time wheelchair user just because I was starting college um, and I can remember spending a lot of time, you know, trying to walk and, you know, with long stem crutches and AFOs and braces and all that kind of stuff. And I just, I didn't feel like I was going to be able to be productive uh, that way. So I've just, I, I made a decision about a year after my injury that to get me a nice wheelchair, a lightweight wheelchair, as light as you could have in, in 1988. And I just moved forward with life. Yeah, because back then, you know, when we get injured, Clint, our first thought is we just want to walk, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and so you started and you did your, your, like you said, the crutches and the AFO. But at some point, you have to decide, is this worth my energy or can I just jump in a chair and, and move 10 times faster? Yeah, that's uh, and that's where I was at, you know, so I spent I was. So my injury was, so I have a spinal cord injury, but also I was ejected out of my car. The car landed back on top of me. I was wrapped between the front tire of the car and the engine. So I have a burn across my back that that injury was as bad as, as actually was worse than the spinal cord injury uh, because they couldn't get, um, I kept dying on the operating table. You know, every time they were trying to, to do stuff for me, I, my body couldn't handle it because of the injuries were so severe. Um, so I was at a general hospital for three months before I even went to rehab. Um, so I, I left rehab or I left a, a general hospital and went right to the Shepherd Center where I spent four months at the Shepherd Center. Um, and I was so behind, you know, because I, because I'd laid in bed for three months. Mm -hmm. um, it took me, you know, three or four weeks just to be able to sit up, you know, in rehab. So I was a little bit behind the eight ball when I started therapy and because I did have a little bit of leg function um like you like you said you know that's when we're young and even even as an older people but we're young in our injury in injury walking is what we want to do you know that's just I just want to be I just want to walk you know mm -hmm. um so so when I left the shepherd center I walked out, stumbled out, you know, with long stem crutches, my mom by my side, my dad helping me in the car and that kind of stuff. I didn't have any wheelchair skills at all because I focused my whole physical therapy on walking. walking through parallel bars and, you know, walking up steps and that kind of stuff. So that was a proud day for you, though. But I mean, walking it was, oh, dude, awesome. absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's all, all of us dream that do that, right? Walk uh, out of the hospital. Yeah. Yeah, and and you know, and, and you feel good about it. And literally, uh, so I I left Shepherd in October of '88. By March of '89, I had decided to go ahead and be a, a wheelchair user because that's when I was starting college. And I can remember trying to walk out in my parents. You know, we we I grew up in the woods, and uh, you know, I had some land I was walking out on, and and I can remember thinking, dang, you know, how can I how can I even carry a book bag, you know? and go to college here i am about to go to college and i can't even carry my books to class so right uh, right so literally that's when i put my stuff away my my crutches and my braces and i i called a local wheelchair company and asked them to build me a lightweight sports chair and um you know that started my career in a chair and when when did you well did you go through the a progression of okay i'm going to be paralyzed for the rest of my life did you get did you go through any sense of depression uh after your injury you know if i did um john i don't remember it um i've always had a, an upbeat spirit uh i was all you know it was always the positive side of everything i could always see the positive side out of everything um i was very fortunate that i had support mm -hmm. from my family going through everything um and and my parents were not the ones that were going to stand by and just let me be down on myself they were always pushers also um so i'd be lying if i if i said that i hadn't had some type of depression i don't think we can go through what we go through and have the drastic changes that we have overnight and not have some kind of depression um 
without and without there, at least some adjustment period at least there, there's got to be you know there's some adjustment periods um i think mine might have happened a little faster than than what others experience mm -hmm. so i didn't have um i didn't have time to to be depressed you know like i said i left i left rehab in october of 88 I started living in March of 89. I started going to college right mm -hmm. away. You know, so October, November, December, January, February, five months, I was back out in the community and in the, in society going to college. Mm -hmm. um, I hear, I hear three things that you're talking about. You, you mentioned one, you have an optimistic view of life, which helps, you know, and two, you had good support and three, you had parents that, that sort of, would kick your ass if you didn't do sure. what you were supposed to do, right? Absolutely. I mean, it was it wasn't an option, you know. I mean, it was like, um, like when I was in school, elementary school, middle school, high school. It was not an option not to get through school, you know. Right. My father was very adamant about the fact that if I just got through school and passed, as long as I um, did well in behavior and wasn't being, you know super bad in school that that he was fine with me coming home with C's mm -hmm. um but not finishing school was not an option right, you know? right and that's kind of the way I think they looked at my injury was um I wouldn't say that I'm successful um I, I feel like I, I I live a successful joyful life mm -hmm. um but I think that my parents had a lot to do with that just by the fact that they were not going to sit by and let me be that person that didn't do anything. Now, one of the things I noticed is similarity in what you said about going back to school and going back to society is that right after I left the hospital, I took a summer course immediately, almost within a month of leaving the hospital. And it sounds like that's what you did as well. You went right back to college and, and sort of was forced to be with everyone else. Yeah, it sort of helped. It does. It totally helps. It doesn't give you time to to fall into that depression and and that it can get very dark for us if we allow it to. Um, you know, isolation. Um, not that I don't love some downtime from here and there, but I don't I don't necessarily do well when I'm alone and have downtime. So that's why I try to stay engaged um, always. You know. Well, last last night when I text your email, you, you said, "Hey, I, I, I'll get back to you because I'm going to go shooting. I'm going to go shoot pool. Is that a is that a pool league you're in, or is it just yeah, friends?" I do. I play in a I play in a pool league on Monday nights. I, I've been playing. I, I played pool most of my life. Um, I played for a little while after my injury, and then I got and and then I started working and career and you know that kind of stuff and and hanging out in a pool hall just wasn't necessarily my thing anymore, you know? Um, but about 13 years ago, 12 or 13 years ago, um, some buddies of mine, they, they said, Hey, let's go play some pool, you know? So I pulled out my old pool cue, um, found out I was still kind of decent at pool, you know? I mean, I'm not, uh, I'm not out there, you know, beating everybody, but I can hold my own, you know? So, um, so yeah, I've been playing 12 or 13 years every night uh, and for a little while I was playing two to three nights a week and again it, it's part of that when you're there with your buddies and you're playing pool you forget about your injury don't you you, you forget yeah. about things you don't think a minute about it like i i don't i i don't think about my injury at all when i'm engaged in doing things um you know mondays are brutal they're by the end of the day i'm beat you know i I work all day, you know, so I start my day at, at 6.30 in the morning. I wake up. I'm usually in the office by 7.30. Um, I drive for about an hour to get to the side of town that my pool league is on. And uh, on those days, I'll either go see my mom and have dinner with my mom or meet with a men's group that I, that I hang out with. And then I play pool until 11.30, you know, so it's that's a long well, day. And, you know, it was midnight. It's twelve thirty before I get home. That's a long day. <laughs> that is a, but that I, whole day, I don't have pain, and I don't think about my injury at all because I'm engaged. The you're whole engaged. Day. You're engaged, and that's sort of similar to what I'm talking about when I was playing the video games. I, I'm so focused that I I don't think about other things, and I don't think about the pain. I don't think about what I'm missing out in life and and the things I can't do and 
and, and I'm just happy I'm doing what I'm doing, right? Yeah. That's what you're doing. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about also some of those other things you do? I know you're, you, you, you do some hand cycling. I know you do some skiing and, and I know I want to hear about this, this indoor skydiving thing. So that has me <laughs> excited. So can you talk a little bit about some of those things you do? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll work backwards from that. Um, okay. So I, I've, I've been, you know, not just active, but I've always been a thrill seeker. Um, I think a lot of us with spinal cord injuries are, you know, we're, we're a little on the dangerous side for the most part, especially the guys, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so I never lost that. And I've always, I've always loved that adrenaline roller coasters going to Six Flags, um, skydiving, you know, real skydiving. Um, and I, you know, I've made four jumps skydiving. So, and jumping out of a real plane, but several you're years. Gonna, you're not going to get me jumping out of a normal <laughs> airplane. And, and I've done too. I actually broke my leg the last jump. So I'm wow. done too. I promised my mom I wouldn't jump out of planes anymore. I had to keep that. <laughs> um, but uh, several years ago, I ran across some people um, that were one lady that was in a chair and she was very active. Uh, she had ran across uh, indoor skydiving out in San Diego. And, uh, and then we have a tunnel here in Atlanta called iFly. Mm -hmm. um, and she had been going kind of regularly, like once a month, just her and her husband and just kind of hanging out. Um, and then through that connection, uh, her and I, and with iFly in Atlanta, we kind of started this, um, it's called the All Abilities Night. Mm -hmm. So once a month under normal conditions, the COVID, is, you know, COVID has us all messed up. We're still mm -hmm. not, we're, even though we opened up a little bit earlier than everybody, Georgia still, we're, we're still not open all the way, you know. Um, so under normal conditions and leading up to COVID, we, we met once a month at iFly and we would fly um, anywhere from 10 to 15 people in wheelchairs uh, once a month. Tell me, how does that work? I, I, I can't picture, I mean, any, <laughs> any, dis, any level or you, I mean, any level, how? Any how level of work? injury, any, absolutely, any level of injury. Uh, we fly, um, you know, T10 pairs, L1 pairs, all the way up to C5 complete quads, power share users, absolutely. Um, and the way the tunnels are set up is there is a, there's a there's an outside perimeter and then a tunnel and you're able to the the door opens up wide enough for most even for most power chairs to be able to come in um, lift your arms up just a little bit as long as you can get your arms up to here the two instructors inside of the tunnel pull you right out of your chair and right into the air and wow. you're, you're flying right away um, and it's it's crazy it's crazy even for me um to see how they can get high level quads in the air wow you know, so, so so we don't need to spend two hundred fifty thousand dollars with virgin galactica to get that <laughs> feeling like no right we you don't you save, can spend you we can should spend save 40, our two hundred fifty thousand and just spend a little a little bit with i fly here right to absolutely get absolutely 40 45 bucks and i can get you in the air in atlanta or really any tunnel in in, in in the united states they have about 18 tunnels i think that uh that have the all abilities night all over the country i believe there is one in philadelphia i, I there's have... one at uh king parisia is that what yeah, that king is of, king of prussia yeah okay okay so there's yeah. one there's one up in that area now t can you tell me a little bit like the people who go there what what is this your sense of their attitude and their psychological well-being or do you, do you get the sense of what pe what type of people go there yeah you know you get a mix um some of the some of the people that we have that come in are still uh not inpatients at rehab centers but have have left inpatient and are are maybe in a what would be considered an outpatient kind of therapy situation so they're not um they're not restrained by the hospital. They're, they're, they're basically, they're on their own. They, you know, they go to a hospital for their rehab, mm -hmm. but they can do whatever they want outside of it. Mm -hmm. so, so some guys are newly injured. Uh, they don't really know what to expect. 
and um, so you get you get these these guys that are coming in. They're scared to death because they don't know. Um, and it's not a uh, it's not a high impact sport at all. It's very gentle. Uh, I mean, you basically float around. It's nothing like jumping out of an airplane, and they they don't they don't really try to recreate that there's it's kind of hard to re recreate jumping out of a plane going 120 miles an hour but um yeah they you get a sense of people that are, are thrilled to know that that it's available for them um and then you get people that have been injured for a long time that um that either just haven't haven't really done anything in life mm -hmm. and and, I, and but at the same time not thinking that it's an indoor skydiving place would even offer an all abilities night where their instructors are trained to pull people in wheelchairs into the air and, and, and help them out and, uh, and do it with, with empathy and, and compassion and, and it's a great night for everybody. It's not just like you're going to, um, it's not just like you're going to drive into Atlanta and, and indoor skydive for the day. We spend three or four hours hanging out, you know, fellowship, laughing, talking about our bow program, how, you know, how we cast, yes. I mean, all that kind yes. of stuff, you know? Yes. That's what the night turns into. And that's, that reminds me of the quad rugby days where, I, you know, I don't even remember who, I, I mean, some of you guys, where you guys are a lot better than I was when it comes to playing and more, I was there to just to hang out and, right. and, and I enjoy more the, the after the games and, and, and hang <laughs> out the, at the dinner and the bars and, and just talking and, you know, and like I said, the, the ability to feel like you're part of somebody again. Yeah. Yeah. And, and normal, you know, like, like I can remember, I remember flying into Philadelphia a lot. You know, I loved you guys up there. You know, all your players up there were great. You know, we played, we played at the Carousel House. Is where we played yeah, rugby at. Yeah, um, you know, past the row houses and everything. Mm -hmm. So we'd play rugby all day, and then we would, you know, our hotel was in the city, so we'd either go down to, you know, Rock Lobster or wherever all the the bars were down by the river and, and that kind of stuff. You know, um, so it was the fellowship after the competition that I always loved too. Um, I, I always, I always took away more out of the fellowship than I did the competition. Yeah. And, and that it, psychologically that it's a huge factor in our ability to feel like we are not alone. And Absolutely. a lot of things of what you seem to do, you, you have a lot of socialization. You have a lot of opportunities to, uh, to integrate with a lot of different people, both able-bodied and disabled people, you know, it sounds like, you know, you, you seem to have worked a life that uh, full of different events and avenues. Well, and that comes from being, that comes from getting comfortable in life, I believe, you know, uh, the psychological side of this is that um, until you have some, some type of acceptance, and that doesn't mean accepting the fact you're never going to walk again. I hope we all walk again. You know, I'm fine if I don't. You know, I'm I'm that, that's fine with me. Um, not everybody's that way. You know, but if if you if you find yourself with some type of acceptance of okay, so this is how it's going to be for today. So let me still go out and play pool with my buddies today in a wheelchair, and if I'm walking next week, then that's fine. You know, um, so. And, and and being disabled, I always looked at it as kind of doubling your odds to have friends because now I can connect with someone that I don't know that's in a wheelchair, and I'm already comfortable with people that are able-bodied because that's the life I came from, you know. Um, I, you know, when I was injured in 1988, I didn't think that people in wheelchairs did things. You know, my grandfather was in a wheelchair from strokes. And all I ever saw him do was lay in the bed. You know, I mean, he he had an old hospital wheelchair that, you know, that they, they kept around his apartment and stuff like that. But mm -hmm. for the most part, I just remember that man being in a bed. And, I, um, I remember you talking one time that someone actually suggested you needed to join, join wheelchair sports or something. Can you bring that story up? Yeah, so, I mean, so... You know, you have to remember, I'm 20 years old, right? I was an active 
uh, individual. I wasn't a superstar sports player, you know, sports athlete or anything, but I, I always played a lot of sports growing up. Um, and I can remember, you know, the three months at Kennesaw at the general hospital that I was at, and then the four months that I was at Shepherd. Um, you are wondering what life is going to be like, you know, without the things that you're used to. Um, so I, I kind of had already started wondering what my life was going to be like without activity and without sports and was maybe already accepting the fact that because I'm in a wheelchair, um, that that's just not something that's available for us, you know. And in 1988, it wasn't readily available. Um, you know, things didn't start changing until the mid-90s as far as adaptive sports and, and how um, – available it is for people nowadays but um yeah i had a guy come into my room um i was 20 i would say he was pro he was probably four or five years older than me and had been injured um for probably six or seven years you know came in he was a young guy he actually worked at shepherd uh he was a c complete c6 um so some some triceps but no finger function at all um had a full-time job, you know, and he had a girlfriend, he had a car, you know, it was just, it was mind boggling to me that this guy was just living a normal life that I, I mean, that I saw. Yes, he had just, everything that you were concerned about, right? Job, yeah, girlfriend, oh, car. Yeah. You know, I mean, I was a house painter before my injury, John, and I knew that I was not ever going to be able to paint houses again for a living, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I can remember I, and I wasn't a college bound person. Like when I graduated high school, um, I was a house painter. That's what I was going to be the rest of my life. I don't have, you know, I don't have a problem with that. I enjoyed what I did. I made decent money and I was good at it, but that's what I was going to be. College wasn't a thing, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I can remember being in the hospital and, and this lady, I'll never forget her name. Her name was Eileen Wayne. She worked for vocational rehab. Uh, Georgia Vocational Rehab. She came into my room. She's a wheel. She's a wheelchair user also, mm -hmm. and um, she was asking me about um, what I was probably going to do for my career choice after this, you know, and if I would be interested in going to school. And I said, "Oh, you know, I'm going to paint houses again. You know, that's what I'm going to do." And and she looked at me and she was dead serious and she said, I "Think you should consider something else." Yeah, <laughs> and 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 reality hit me, and it's like. Well, I don't have any other skills. I've only learned how to paint houses, you know. Um, so I was al always interested in music. And um, and then after speaking further with, with vocational rehab, found out that they would pay for my school. Uh, so literally, they paid every, every dime for me to go to school. Uh, and I ended up with a music business degree, you know. So I ended up in a field that I loved, um, in an industry that I was in the music industry. Mm -hmm. So, so in some ways, I hate to say it, but the accident sort of gave you a different view and different opportunity in life that you would have never even thought about. It did. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I don't hesitate one minute telling people that it's probably the best thing that ever happened to me. Yeah, um, not that you want to be paralyzed, but you, yeah, yeah, you took the best part of it and and made it made it yeah, work. Absolutely, and I and I know that that's not the case for everybody, and I don't I don't even pretend that it is. But for me personally, and I wasn't a bad person, I probably wasn't on the greatest path, um, and I didn't and I didn't change my ways a lot. My injury didn't change me a lot. I still was on a not so great path for a lot of my life, you know, uh, but I was able, able to overcome some of that as well. Um, yeah. Some of the demons prior to your injury followed you afterwards. They, I mean, your injury doesn't just change you. Like you said, it, it did follow you a little bit, but you've overcome it and you moved on. Now I did have a, I, there is a question here on that. I think you may be able to answer better than I do. Okay. One of the questions, one of the people asked, how do I meet local people with SCIs? How would you do that if, if, so, you, if you were um, starting fresh? So for someone new, let's just let's just use a scenario that you just you're just now leaving rehab and you live in Cincinnati, Ohio. Mm -hmm. You're going 
home, you know, to a rural area. Um, what would you do? I, I personally now, with the way the internet is, is I would Google people, I would just say people with spinal cord injuries in Cincinnati or Atlanta or Cleveland or wherever you live and, and find, start finding some results that way. I would try to find, I would reach out to social media aspects and um, find groups on social media to where you can ask the question in a group of people, hey, are there other people with spinal cord injury that live in this particular area? Or support right. groups. And there are. There are people that, I mean, you're going to be hard pressed not to find two or three people that are pretty close to each other in location that has spinal cord injury. Yeah. Their injuries might be totally different, right. but there's going to still be a lot of common. Um, I know said on the Facebook that you, um, you're the administrator. Some people, I see people putting out, a, hey, anyone here, you know, live, I'm from Texas and does anyone. I see it all the time. You get responses constantly. Like, hey, absolutely. I'm from Texas. Yep, Absolutely. Um, and then, you know, one of my missions is to, to be able to get, you know, of course with COVID, but be able to get back to having face-to-face -face support group meetings and uh, starting those meetings, whether it be a Spinal Cord Injury USA, um, Cincinnati chapter, you know, uh, Ohio chapter. You know, I have several chapters in, in Georgia that, um, that we were meeting monthly and not just roundtable meeting talking about our stuff but you know going bowling uh, playing a game of pool you know going to have dinner together just just normal stuff that um you know that and that was drawing people like you know we would start out with four people in our group and then someone would say oh there's a you know there's a support group meeting down in you know the south side of atlanta and then two people would, two more people would join, you know, and now we have like 15 people. Um, right, right. So well, that's how it, that's how it spreads. Well, yeah, and, and that sounds like a great way to just start small, but, it, it, you know, word of mouth always creates a lot more interest and, and God knows we need more people um, that are of similar background and, you know, we have a lot of commonality. So I am going to uh, actually we're getting close to our 10 minute mark of finish up. So I am going to say thank you to Clint for being on the panel with me today and sharing your insight. I appreciate it. I hope you come back another time when we have other topics. Um, and thank you again for your, your insight and your experience. Absolutely. I, I enjoyed it. I appreciate it. I appreciate the uh, invite to join you guys and uh, I'm all yours, man. Anytime. Let's, let's talk. Thank you. Talk to you soon, Clint. All right. Have a good day. So listeners, I am going to, I want to make sure I go through some of the questions that you guys have asked um, so that I cover a few of these things. So one, one listener, right. You know, how do you build resilience? You know, resilience, how, how Resilience will keep you from depression, anxiety, and isolate. What is resilience? You know, um, first of all, let me say it again. Let me thank Clint for being on. Um, he was an inspiration to me when I talked to him. He, he, he has all the right things going on. Don't get me wrong. Clint has some other stuff that he has had to go through that, you know, you and I have, we, we even understand, but he's made it through this far. I uh, continues to put all the right things and the right steps in front of him. But so, and part of it is he's resilient. He, you know, resilience is about being able to overcome difficult issues, things. The paralysis itself is hard, but it's the everyday life stuff that's even harder. You know, I, I expressed at one point, you know, caregiver, I, I had, I lost all my care. Thank God I have, I have, my wife, because I lost all my caregivers in the last two months from their medical, they had their own issues at home and things happened and all of a sudden no one was coming. And, and so I've been going on the internet, looking at different websites and trying to, and I'm struggling with trying to find good people to come um, to find the right people to, 
for a quadriplegic, our, our care is a little complex. You just can't come have someone come in. And, and, and so I'm very anxious at times to, to bring people that really don't seem to match well. Um, so, you know, resilience, how do you become more resilient when these things happen? Because, you know, if it's not caregiver issue just today, it's going to be another issue a month from now. I hope it's, I rather have these issues than medical issues, to be honest. I hate when I have a medical issue, if it's a kidney stone, if it's a bladder infection again, or if it's a sore. So I'm all about dealing with more social issues and psychological issues than I am medical issues. Um, but how do you build resilience? Well, you need, you need to have a purpose in life. That's one. One, you need like Clint, Clint has a purpose in life. His goal is to, to, to integrate more social support. He seems to have me, when he wakes up in the morning, he knows what he has to do. He has to work and he has to do some other things that make his life meaningful. For me, you know, I, I do struggle with this once in a while. You would think I would know what I'm doing in my life half the time, but you know, I know one of my purposes in life is to teach. I love teaching. That's why I'm a professor. That's why I'm a psychologist. I like to be uh, the mentor. I have a lot of grasshoppers out there uh, that um, that I'm I'm part of their lives. I like to guide their life, and I like to make think that I'm gonna I've impact their life. Um, you know, I, I picture myself just like one of those Buddhas, uh, Confucius guys sitting on top of the mountain stroking their their beard and just saying uh you know making these incredible phrases that sometimes you wonder what the what was he think was he talking about but so have purpose um you have to have an optimistic view of life you have to like clint he's, he's always been an optimist he he had that you know i think you're either born with it and you're not born with it it's, it's hard to to take someone that's pessimistic and just flip them around to be an optimist. But if you're an optimist, it helps. It helps with resilience. Um, what, what else? It's, you have to be a good problem solver. Now, I'm gonna have to get together with some of you out there and help me figure out how to do this caregiver thing because it's been 33 years and I've been dealing with caregivers all these years. I've yet to find a good efficient way to have backups and multiple things when things happen. So I'm still learning, but I'm pretty good problem solver. I usually take on a challenge and I try to problem solve it. Uh, let's see, what else? Nurture yourself. So I'm here, I'm giving you all these things, items to help with resilience, how to handle your life when things go wrong. You have to give yourself some comfort, nurture yourself. Meaning what? You need to play a, a few, some video games. You need to hang out with your friends. Uh, you need to have a beer with your buddy. You know, these are nurture, these are deposits in your brain, okay? Deposits into your ATM, okay? So meaning in life, nurturing, optimistic view, let's see, social support, Number four, you have to have people around you who really care about you for being who you are. Not because you're disabled, not because you're family, just because you are a human being. Social support, good people. Now, listen, you can't get social support unless you're giving social support right? You can't have people good be good to you unless you're being good to them. In one of my questions, I asked my students in class, I said, how many friends do you have? How many good friends do you have? And I always start off by saying, how many Facebook friends do you have? And some of my students would say, oh, I have like 2,000 Facebook friends. I have a 3,000. I'm like, do you really know that many people? And they're like, no, no, I don't. And, I, and then I would narrow it down, I would say, look, how many 
good friends, you, you would say that it's your best friend. And some people would say, oh, I have five or I have seven. And I'm like, no, I, and I would challenge it. I'm saying, that's impossible. I, I said, research shows you should, the most, maybe three. Why three? Because it takes energy, time to really know someone's life, to, to stay on top of someone's life. I'll, I'll give you two examples. I have a good friend named Brian and I was considered my best friend. And I would have a, I have another good friend that named Peter. Uh, I have one, I have about three individuals. And, and we call, now Brian, I call probably almost once a week, Peter almost once a day. It, it takes energy to just say, hi, how are you doing? What's going on? Because it's part of your life. So again, social support, you got to give to get. So, so these are coming back to you. How do you develop resilience? Problem solving, social support optimistic view you like, nurture yourself. Okay. Um, let me see what else am I, what are some of the other questions? Well, fighting depression. Now, research shows that after a spinal cord injury, most people actually do not get depressed. Just like Clint said, there is an adjustment period is it clinical depression? Most of us do not get a clinical depression after spinal cord injury. There is adjustment process, but that's normal. True depression, most of us don't have, but there is a group that, that will, a percentage that's higher than the normal population. So having the injury does increase your susceptibility to being depressed the percentage goes up. How do you fight that? Well, I always start with the basis. The basis is always biological. You have to get your caregiver issues figured out. You got to get your medical uh, system stabilized. I do believe that without those medical things stabilized, it's easier to get depressed. Once you get those things stabilized, the, the, the most second most important thing after that is start to socialize, get yourself out there, okay? Just like what Clint said, get out there, be, start integrating with others that are in wheelchair. Now, now it's, it's funny because every time I hear someone who's a quadriplegic like myself, but then he's an incomplete, I get jealous because Anything that's below my level, I get jealous because, you know, they could do so much more, right? So, you know, Clint has a little abs, you know, I wonder if he has a six pack, but, you know, that tells me, you know, if you have trunk, that means you're probably pretty good uh, transporting or uh, transferring, I mean, not transferring. My frustration in life in the beginning of my injury was two factors. One, the bowel routine. The bowel routine restricted everything in my life. I couldn't go anywhere. I couldn't do it. It, 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 it restricted that three hour routine almost. Two was the transfer. I thought if I can transfer, then that solves most of my problems, which in, in, in relevance, it, it was two out of many things that I had to learn to adjust in order to survive with this injury. So, Kaylee, are there any questions uh, that, I, that I need to address, do you feel, before I go? Uh, we are coming up to our hour. I want to make sure I cover everything. You know, it is a, about talk to me. I want to hear from you listeners out there. Sure. We have one last question in the Q&A box, and the question is, I would like to know how do I get my 24 year old to understand that my husband and I who are in our early sixties will not be around forever and that he needs to be proactive with learning to be more independent. That is a great question. And yes, that is, 
incredibly insightful on your part because like you said, you're in your 60s already. You're starting to move into the phase of totally enjoying more of yourself as you get closer to retirement. And this 24 year old, well, first thing I would say is get this, get your, I think, did you say son? Involved in social activities with people with disabilities. It's just like Clint, get him involved with others who are in wheelchairs because they will start to get him to see the world a little differently. If he's always only hanging around with able-bodied people, he's always gonna feel like he's a deficit. So my suggestion is get him involved with social events and social activities. And reach out to local rehabs that are, um, well, not local, but rehabs are geared with spinal cord injuries, like, like uh, McGee in Philadelphia, like Shepherd Center, like Kessler. You know, these are areas like, and look on our website here, Christopher Dana Reed Foundation. They may have resources that will help guide, get, guide him in reaching out. So I want to uh, thank you everyone for listening today. I, you know, your time is life. I, I've stayed, stated before, time is life, life is time. Every time you spend an hour with me, you are giving, your, giving yourself a part of your life to me. I want to thank you for that. I hope this uh, podcast was entertaining and enjoying, enjoy, um, entertaining and enjoyable today. Thank you once again. Please come uh, talk to me. Um, this is Dr. John signing off. Have a good day.